And not for taking it to the state where for smashing it. Right? But if you destroy, smash, break the existing castle estate, what happens the day after the revolution? What happens the week after the revolution? The month? The year after the revolution? Not the ultimate goal, but what happens then? Do you move straight to a stateless society, or does the working class need to organise a state of its own based on workers' councils or Soviets and so on to organise workers' power? Is that necessary? I think that if you pose that question clearly, putting your head in line in real life, you pose that question clearly, the answer is equally clear. The answer is yes, we do. And that anarchists would say they reject, as 95% of anarchists, that we reject any notion of state power to against all authority and so on, are clearly wrong. And I want to give two straightforward reasons for that. The first reason, it's quite simply that the class state, the need for state apparatus, the state uh, at all, derives from the fact that society is divided into classes and there's class struggle. The state is an apparatus for defending the power of the ruling class. Okay? But the, the day of, the day after, the week after, the months after a revolution, it changes which is the ruling class, from the capitalist class to the working class, but it doesn't abolish classes. It doesn't mean that the class struggle disappears. The whole history of all attempts to create a better society and of all revolutions from 1848 in Paris through the Paris Commune onwards to, to the most recent ones shows that when working class people start to organise themselves to own society, especially if they succeed in one part of the world in doing so for a short while, the ruling class, the old capitalist class, doesn't give up and go away. Why would they? They say to themselves, we still rule in other parts of the world. These people, these ignorant masses, they can't run society. They will destroy society and civilization as we know it. We must organize to smash them and that's what they do. I just say, I'll give you one, just recall one example of this, you might, the Paris Commune. The working people of Paris uh, in 1871, rose up and took control of the city. They did it in one day, actually. Right? The overwhelming masses of moved and they took control of the city. Magnificent. They held it for 74 days. What did the ruling class of France do and their government, led by a man called Avotier? Did he say, well, this is an interesting social experiment. Well, let's see how they they, they get on. <laughs> right? With, with their aim of creating a new republic for the working people and freedom and equality and so on. He moved to the Palace of Versailles, down the road, right, teamed up with the Prussian army that happened to have just invaded France at that time of World War all around, assembled a counter-revolutionary army and attacked the, the, the city of Paris from the, the west. The result was uh, a week of blood, a Saman Sagante, in which 30,000 Parisian workers were slaughtered in the streets of Paris in seven days. Right? That, that was what they did. And that could serve as a model for what they've always done. For what they've always done. When the Russian workers took power in 1917, October 1917, they didn't say, oh well, our time is, our time is up. Tsarism was obviously out of date. Uh, anachronism and so on, let's move on. But <coughs> um, well, they teamed up with imperialism, 14 armies invaded Russia, the white generals, they slaughtered everybody they could get their hands on uh, 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 and, and tried to destroy it. Uh, uh, what happened in Spain with a radical government, uh, left a popular front government, Franco, rising, <coughs> fascist rising, uh, uh, and so on, hundreds of thousands, civil war, hundreds of thousands of people. Slaughtered. What happens in Chile with the popular unity government and so on? I, I haven't got time to go through all these dogs, but that is what they do in that situation. They will do the same. Do you need a state to fight in that situation? Of course you need a state. Do you need to have armed forces? You need to have armed forces. Right. Can you say, we'll let each uh, city, each community, each area just do its own thing? No, you can't. It would be lovely if you could, but then the, the other side would simply concentrate their forces on where you're weakest, smash that, and then move on to the next one. Where they're weakest, you have to have a national strategy and, uh, uh, and so on. That's uh, 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 unavoidable. And so 
you'd need to do that. If you have armed forces and you have to have a national strategy, that means a uh, 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 Second reason, more or less the same, extension the same, but worth saying, you need it to develop a socialist economy. Again, let me pose the question. <coughs> Who will own and run on the day after the revolution, or the week after, or month after, the hospitals, the schools, the railway system, uh, uh, the tra transport in general, the welfare system? Who will pay unemployment benefits? Who will help the sick and disabled? And, uh, uh, and so Who will pay this? And if you say, well, the communities will do them all by themselves, Wonderful, eventually, but in a revolution, communities are divided, they're not united. If the community was just all united, you wouldn't need a revolution, would you? There is a big class division in the community. You can't say, well, the railway system, you know, we'll do it town by town, village by village. If the, if, if the right wing happened to be predominant uh, in, in, in Isha, but the left are running things in uh, <coughs> London and Southampton. The revolutionaries are running things in London and Southampton. Never mind that the train has to go through the right wing village because the community owns that station. You can't do it like that. You have to have a state, you have to say the state owns it. If you, are you going to cut off all unemployment benefit and all sickness benefit and everything like that for <coughs> people the day after the, the revolution? I know you can say that under socialism or anarchism you wouldn't have unemployment. That's true. But that won't be true a week after the revolution. Are you going to cut everybody's benefit off? Right. No. You're going to pay them benefit. How are you going to pay their benefit? You pay benefits out of taxes. What is the body that collects taxes from people? You're going to say, well, we just do it by everybody will take around collecting things in the street. <laughs> so, no, you have to have taxes. What is the body that collects taxes? That's a state. You have, you know, so there's no choice in that situation. But to run and develop a country, you have to. Yeah, you have to have a state. If you say, in those, the immediately post revolution situation, we reject all authority, nobody's got a right to collect any taxes because we don't allow anybody to do that. Nobody's got a right to tell anybody what to do, so we won't have any armed forces. Nobody who can do any of those things, no matter how democratically controlled they are or whatever, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means the counter revolution will be. You won't have a revolution that survives. The other side, who will be organised, who will have no qualms about any of these things, will smash you. I think that's very, very clear. I would say what it was. Okay, second, second issue. <coughs> Leadership and the role of the party in the uh, And here I want to say that you speak to anarchists, autonomists and so on, and they will tell you but the trouble is people believe in leadership and we should get this idea out of our heads. You don't have to have leaders. By an act of willpower, we can get rid of having leaders. You just have to think differently. I don't think that's the problem. I do not believe that the problem is that all over the world and throughout the history of the working movement, people have this wrong idea of leadership. You know, uh, Marx jokes about this, this guy who had the wrong idea of gravity in his head and everywhere he looked at he found that the, the ill effects of gravity, people kept falling over, things, so on people. No, no, it's not that people have a wrong idea in their heads. Leadership and the role of leadership in the movement derives from a real problem that we all know is a problem in our workplace, in our community, in our trade union branch, in wherever we are. And that is that the level of people's consciousness, awareness, and commitment and energy and so on is not even. You call a meeting at work to fight the boss, not everybody turns up. Some do, some don't. You're having a, a you organize a strike. Some people join the picket line, other people don't. Some people organize the picket line. Some people come out and strike, some people don't. It's not even. There is unevenness in the movement, in the struggle, everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about the Occupy movement, or the strikes in Greece, or the Egyptian revolution, or the Russian revolution, or whatever. There's always this unevenness in military consciousness. What are leaders? Leaders in the sense that we're talking about, they're not appointed people from the club. They're not people with badges. They're people who are actually leading the struggle. But they're the people who are leading the struggle in your estate, in your workplace. 
uh, in your stream, in your college, etc. Uh, 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 and that is indispensable. It's not simply in you know, a capitalist society where people develop our neighborhood, that is going to be the, uh, the case. <laughs> right. Now, if you respond to this by saying we're going to have no leadership, we're going to do away with it, right, what actually happens? You don't get the leadership to do the first is that you yourselves, first of all, have an unelected leadership. And the anarchist movement is a history of unelected leaders. Mm -hmm. I have joke about this with people and say, right, when we debate anarchism, we debate about with the only sort of where I'm going to be But you've heard of Bakunin, right, one of the founders of anarchists. Tell me what is his movement for? I, I did this once a you know, because somebody knew. But I bet you 95% of you, if you've heard of Bakunin, you haven't heard of what his movement was. You've heard of maybe of Makhno in the Russian for Makhno, but you haven't heard of what his movement was for. They, these were anarchist leaders. Bakunin is a wonderful example of him because he operated actually a secret faction inside Mark of the First International, the uh, 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 International Working Men's Association. Or was an unelected leadership, and in a few private letters he admitted to this. Right. What you normally get is an unelected, informal leadership of those who speak there, dominate the meetings and so on. And precisely because you don't acknowledge this leadership, you can't vote them out. At least in a, you know, a Chotsky type party, you do get to vote for who the Central Committee would be, and if you don't like them, you can vote against them, uh, 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 and so on. So, you don't solve that problem. The second problem, even more serious than that, much more serious, that's a kind of point really, much more serious than this, is that a denouncing leadership does not solve the problem of the leadership in the working class movement. Mm -hmm. And again, we have 150 years of experience with this. If revolutionaries don't win the leadership, <coughs> it doesn't become a leaderless movement, it becomes a movement led by reformists. And we know what the reformists do. They demobilize the movement and they betray it. And they play into the hands of the right wing. Right? If we don't fight for the leadership for uh, revolutionary socialism, the, the Blairs, the Millivans, and the ancestors of the Blairs and Millivans, the Noskers and Scheidemans who murdered Rosa Luxemburg yes. and Karl Liebknecht in the German Revolution, or the Allende's who paved the way, unfortunately, for the Pinochet coup in Chile, or the leaders of the Spanish Popular Front who failed to mobilize the way and let Franco win, and so on and so forth, they will dominate and will so on. Now, when we talk about fighting for leadership, clear what we really mean. We don't mean that the leaders of the FWP engage in a punch up with the leaders of the Labour Party as to who will be leaders. That's not what we mean. We don't mean fighting for leadership is fighting other leaders. We mean working to persuade, to win over all those people who are said are the actual leaders of, uh, of the class in trouble, all those people who are leading it in the workplaces, in, on the estates, in the to win them over, uh, right, back to a revolutionary perspective. We're fighting all the ways to persuade people. Now, to do that, what you have to do is you have to organize bring together and get to work together those key people. Those people who are the actual, the more militant element. Of the those, are, those people who do want to see socialist and revolutionary change in all the struggles and there of the, of the working class. And that is what we're talking about when we're talking about the need of power. Not people to rule the working class, but people to win the working class for what needs to be done in the struggle to secure the, the victory of in, the, uh, 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 in the revolution. So that's why we, uh, Leninists, Trotskyists, etc., argue for the need for a political party of the working class. Uh, that's that's why uh, and that's why we try. That's why we try and recruit. By the way, I know there's a widespread idea that they're always asking people to join and so on because they want their gain to be bigger. That's actually not the issue. It, it's because you know, unless you build such an organisation, you don't actually win uh, 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 in the struggle. And there's, you know, again, 100, 150 years of experience that shows that, that having such a party 
and winning the above that we're working fast in that way uh, is essential for the revolution. Right, the last point, I knew this would happen, I wouldn't have time enough to deal with it properly, but there you go. Russia in 1917 was well, there is a belief that all of what I'm saying might or might not be true, but look what happened in Russia. Isn't it the case that Bolshevism, uh, uh, having a revolutionary party and so on, led to Stalinism? And can't you see that what Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks did, they committed all these crimes, they made all these mistakes, they did all these terrible things that led to, 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 to Islam. The proof is Bolshevik authoritarianism. Didn't they establish a one party state? Didn't they go on about the need for the labor discipline and uh, making workers <coughs> work harder uh, and so on and uh, <coughs> supporting management in factories? Didn't they, you know, shoot down workers at Kronstadt, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all those uh, uh, and I got On this, I, I want to, to make uh, two points. The, the first is that you could, if you go through a list of all these things the Bolsheviks did, and you don't put them in the context, right, then they do really sound dreadful. But you have to understand the context in which they, they did. Now, this is not just special pleading for uh, this. I, I use in the book a simple example. If I tell you a horror story about a revolutionary who stabbed a woman, uh, who shot a woman uh, uh, in the chest and killed her in cold blood, shot her a few yards away, and I just tell you that story, it can prove that every revolutionary from Jean-Paul Mara onwards was a criminal uh, and, a, a, and a misogynist woman killer. If I then say, but the problem was actually not that at all. The problem was she was advancing, she was a counter-revolutionary who had a knife in her hand and was to try to kill him, then it's different. As it happened, Jean-Paul Mara didn't have a gun to shoot her with. She did advance and she did kill him. Uh, you know, so the context makes a difference. And in the context of Russia, you cannot talk about what the Bolsheviks did except in the context of the past.